Good morning, everybody. How we doing today? Uh, welcome back. Oh, it's morning for me here. Um, hope hope you've been keeping up with all of our lecture material that you've been practicing using uh, the slides and the powerpoints, the practice problems, the review and reinforce uh, questions that are there. And I hope that you've been well at this point coming to talk to me in office hours or going to. Uh, your SI um, sessions, meeting with your TAs, posting to your discussion boards. So there's a lot of resources out there to, to help you digest all this information. Uh, we're going to get going with Lecture 5, Active Transport here. So up until this point, we have gone over what is anatomy and physiology. We've talked about cells and their organelles. Then we got a little bit deeper into their plasma membranes and the proteins that are in those uh, plasma membranes, uh, how they work, how they're transporting material, uh, either through diffusion, passive transport, bulk transport, and osmosis. Today, we're gonna be going over active transport. So how are these membrane proteins using energy to move substances across the plasma membrane and what is different between the active transport aside from just using energy uh, versus our, our passive transport. So let's get going. Uh, we are going to be again distinguishing between primary and secondary active transport and we're going to have some examples of each examples that you'll need to know on an exam and be able to identify. Take a minute, <clears throat> take a minute and uh, tell me what is wrong with this image. Okay, so hopefully you looked at this and saw that here we have on the left side, we have two little green squares. And over here we have a whole bunch of green squares and the arrow is showing that that green square is moving in this direction. The problem with that is in order for diffusion to occur, molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. So in this image, that arrow should be pointing in this direction, correct? Well, what we're going to be learning is that when we add energy to the system, some of these proteins allow the cell to bring in a, a molecule up its concentration gradient. So it's moving in the opposite direction than what it would normally move with diffusion. And this is why we need to have energy. So you can think of this as uh, going up an escalator. It requires electricity to carry you up those moving stairs. If you walk up a set of stairs or a ladder, you're utilizing energy, okay? Um, it's a little bit different than a slide. When you're on a slide, you're sliding down and you're not using any energy. Uh, so if you were to slide up, that would be kind of fun, but um, you would, again, need some kind of energy to move you up that slide. All right, now we've talked about bulk transport, passive transport, today is active transport and there's two types that we'll be looking at primary active transport and secondary active transport active transport like i said before requires energy requires atp to move some type of solute or molecule against its concentration gradient or against an electrical gradient which we'll get more into later in the semester and we utilize carrier proteins so we're kind of combining what we learned about in passive transport where we had proteins that needed to facilitate or carry uh, molecules across that membrane but they were still doing it down the concentration gradient today we'll be looking at or proteins that are moving those solutes or molecules up their concentration gradient in primary active transport there's a direct use of ATP, uh, a direct breakdown of that ATP in order to uh, change the shape of those proteins so that they can uh, move these molecules down, uh, up their concentration gradient. Where secondary active transport, these proteins rely on the uh, concentration gradients that are built by primary active transport proteins. Uh, that may be a little confusing right now, but we'll uh, 
eventually add some clarity to that. If we look at this image, let's start uh, kind of dissecting what's going on here. So uh, primary active transport, we can consider them as pumps. Uh, when we pump water up a hill, again, we're, required, we're, we're utilizing that energy to move it. So down here, we can see we've got this membrane protein and on that membrane protein we have a binding site. We can see that there's a pathway through here, a channel, and there's a binding site within that membrane protein, but it's closed on the other side. We can see that we have a higher concentration of these yellow molecules outside of the cell and we see that we have a lower concentration of those yellow molecules inside the cell. What's happening is that this chemical binding site is specific for this molecule. When it enters into our protein, it binds, but there is no conformational change yet. Uh, and so in order for that to happen, an ATP molecule is dephosphorylated and splits into ADP and phosphate. That phosphate binds to our molecule or to our membrane. That creates some kind of conformational change. That molecule now can pass through to its other side as that, mem uh, as that chemical breaks free from its binding site. Uh, that phosphate is released and that can be utilized to make another ATP. At the end, what we've done is effectively moved these molecules up their concentration gradient from low to high. Now the most important pump that we're going to be talking about this semester is our sodium potassium pump. Um, we can also call it the sodium potassium ATPase because it's breaking down ATP and we'll see how that happens. Now let's first look at number one here. If we see that uh, we've got our plasma membrane and we have an integral membrane protein embedded in there, you can see it's closed on the extracellular side but on the extracellular side we have a high concentration of sodium and a low concentration of potassium. In the cytoplasm we have a low concentration of sodium and a high uh, concentration of potassium. What happens is that this membrane protein has three binding sites for sodium ions. As those sodium ions bind to those binding sites, it stimulates the phosphorylation of ATP. So we split off one phosphate uh, and an ADP. When that happens, it causes a change in the protein shape where it then opens on the extracellular side of our cell or our plasma membrane. And it also changes the shape of these sodium binding sites. Notice how they're much smaller and less circular like they were over here. This basically squeezes those sodium ions out or forces them out or kicks them out, however you wanna uh, refer to that. And so they are now moving into the extracellular space. What also happens though, is over here, these triangles, we can see these two triangles on the right side have gotten bigger than they were over here. And so now these are binding sites for potassium ions. And now potassium ions can bind to this molecule or to this protein and when they bind, it triggers the release of that phosphate, which then causes that protein to return to its original shape. And it's going to squeeze out those uh, potassium ions inside of the cell. And you'll also notice that during that change, the sodium binding sites have returned back to their original shape. So now sodium will bind will break apart an ATP, it'll change shape, it'll release three sodium ions in uh, outside of the cell, two potassiums will bind, it'll release the phosphate, it'll change shape, and potassium will be released inside of the cell. And this is gonna continue over and over and over again. 
Most of our cells spend about 30% of their energy managing the sodium potassium pumps. When we get into unit three, when we talk about neurons, neurons are expending about 70% of their energy uh, in order to just manage the sodium potassium pump. And we're gonna see how all these ion channels work together. So really it's, uh, it's gonna come back uh, over and over again. I can't stress that enough. So please do spend some time getting this concept down. Here's our review and reinforce slide. So go ahead and pause the video practice some of these questions, and we'll come back here in a bit. All right, so a little bit more about our sodium potassium pump. What is it doing? It is utilizing a lot of energy. I just mentioned that most cells about 30%, neurons about 70%. But it's also going to help maintain our resting membrane potential. We're going to get into this more in depth in uh, unit three, but there is a, a, a charge across our membrane um, and we can measure that. Most uh, of our neurons are around negative 70 millivolts, but in order to, I guess by, by moving sodium ions out and potassium ions in, if you think about the movement, even though they're both positive ions, we're moving three positive ions outside of the cell and we're bringing in two positive ions. So what is the difference in charge there? Hopefully you said, well, we're moving three positives out and bringing in two positives. So we're actually losing, for every time that sodium potassium pump works, we're losing one positive charge to the extracellular fluid. So technically we're making the extracellular fluid a little bit more positive and we're making our cytoplasm a little bit more negative. Okay, and that's gonna create that uh, resting membrane potential. We're gonna see how that works with muscles and neurons. The sodium potassium pump also is really important in regulating our cellular volume. So we talked about osmosis last week and cells need to be at an osmotic equilibrium. Um, if you look at all of these uh, things going on in this normal cell, uh, you don't need to memorize this. This is just to kind of highlight this point is the importance of regulating cellular uh, volume. So if we're at equilibrium, well, we have some ions that are moving in, some ions moving out just through our leak channels. We also have other ions moving back and forth, but here's our sodium potassium pump, busy working three sodium out and bringing two potassium in, and that allows water uh, to, to not move out or to not move in. So we're basically in an isotonic state. That cell's not shrinking, that cell is not uh, uh, increasing in size or lysing. But if we inhibit that sodium potassium pump, in this case with a, a molecule called bobane, uh, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, it, it inhibits the movement of that uh, potassium, sodium potassium pump. Well, we still have some ions moving in and we still have ions moving out, but what's happening is we're increasing the osmolarity inside of our cell, which is then causing water to move in. And so now we're in this hypotonic environment and we run the risk of those cells swelling and eventually lysing. So that can be pretty destructive to our bodies and to the organs and tissues where this is happening. Now let's look at how this is gonna affect other types of transport. First, we'll start with a quick refresher. Here is what we have jammed into your brains in the last couple of lectures. When we started talking about the transport of materials, we talked about our bulk transport. We said bulk transport can be divided into endo and exocytosis. Endocytosis can be divided into phagocytosis, cell eating, pinocytosis, cell drinking, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Exocytosis is sending things out of the cell. Then we talked about passive transport, which is divided into just simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis, or the diffusion of water. 
and that facilitated diffusion using those helping uh, membranes or membrane proteins. We have channel mediated and we have carrier mediated. Now we're over here talking about active transport and we're looking at primary and secondary active transport and we'll be going into more depth on those. But I wanted to just bring these channels back in just as a uh, connection here to, to kind of compare and contrast as you're learning these. Remember, channel mediated facilitated diffusion is mostly ions. They have some kind of channel that opens and closes depending on whether or not we change that electrical voltage, which we just talked about how the sodium potassium pump is managing that, whether a ligand or a chemical binds to these to open it or close it, maybe acetylcholine um, or a neurotransmitter, and then our mechanically gated uh, channels, which some kind of mechanical deformation. Our other type of um, carrier mediated or our other type of facilitated diffusion was carrier mediated facilitated diffusion and we said this was for a single type of chemical or chemical family uh, chemicals or molecules that are too large for those channels and so they needed to uh, move in bind change, a sh change the shape of that protein and then move in but again they are moving down their concentration gradient and we called those uniporters. So if we look at this image, what's happening here with, whoops, sorry, what's happening here with those two images? Now, hopefully you maybe saw the little flash forward, but hopefully you said, well, hey, this one on the membrane protein on the left is moving two different substances in the same direction. And in the protein on the right, we're moving the blue one in one direction and we're moving the purple molecule in the other direction. So symporters, also called co-transporters, are moving two molecules in the same direction, either intracellularly to the extracellular environment or vice versa, whereas antiporters are moving two substances, two molecules, in the opposite direction. Now, secondary active transport is the indirect use of energy. It requires, well, it depends on using the concentration gradient that active transport has created. Um, and what it's doing is it's taking one of these molecules and it's going to allow one of these molecules to move down its concentration gradient while it's moving the other molecule, in this case the purple one, against its concentration gradient. So we'll go into this in a little bit more detail here. So here's a good example to show primary and secondary active transport. So our Sodium potassium pump is considered an antiport, right? It is moving three sodium in one direction and moving two potassium in the opposite direction. And it's directly using ATP. In doing so, it's building a higher concentration of sodium ions outside of our cell here. But we have these other proteins, our secondary active transport proteins, that are utilizing the potential energy of that concentration gradient of sodium to move glucose up its concentration gradient. So sodium is going to diffuse down naturally, but glucose needs help and needs to be carried up its concentration gradient. So like we saw with that uh, sodium potassium pump, sodium will bind, glucose will bind, that protein changes shape and opens, sodium is moving down its concentration gradient, uh, and uh, like we saw with our channel mediated uh, uh, ch uh, proteins, and glucose is moving up its concentration gradient. So let's look at that in a different way. 
here are the uh, here's the sodium potassium pump our sodium ions have been released we have a higher concentration of sodium ions outside of the cell we see that that sodium ion binds to its bind its active binding site here and glucose needs to bind to its active binding site here that protein changes shape sodium moves down its concentration gradient into the cell and glucose has moved up its concentration gradient into the cell all of this depends on that original primary active transport the direct use of that atp molecule of that uh, sodium potassium pump so two things happening at the same time and they're uh, the the secondary active transport is not directly using energy but it's requiring the potential energy that has been uh, developed by that primary active transport i hope that makes sense if you don't please send me a message or you know come and talk to me at office hours a couple of other examples that you'll see is uh, sodium and calcium so here we have an anti-port uh, sodium is going to move down its concentration gradient and calcium is going to bind and move up its concentration gradient same thing over here just with a different ion we're now looking at hydrogen ions so sodium is diffusing down its concentration gradient back into the cell where hydrogen is being moved up its concentration gradient outside of the cell here is a really great animation i really like this animation so i'm going to throw it out there you can expect to see this on a test please spend some time looking at this i'm going to let this animation run for a couple of minutes i'm just going to step out of the field of view here and what i want you to do is spend some time just staring at this diagram and following the red and digesting what is happening here now we've spent uh we've used the stomach and um, our intestines and our digestive system for multiple examples talking about osmosis and fiber um, and now we're going to talk about the lumen of our stomach or the empty space within our stomach so again spend a couple of minutes here looking at this what's going on and can you apply any of the information about our passive and active transport into this diagram and animation How to go welcome back all right let's digest this a little bit together so let's start down here in the bottom left hand corner we are in the stomach so this so right here is our lumen this is the empty space of our stomach these cells are simple columnar cells that are lining uh, our stomach the inside of our stomach when you eat that broccoli that makes its way down into your stomach where your stomach is using smooth muscle to contract and to mechanically break it down but you also need a chemical environment and we need to produce hydrochloric acid so that we can also chemically digest that food so how does it all work well co2 if you remember gases are going to diffuse across the plasma membrane they don't need any proteins so we can see here that CO2 is moving down its concentration gradient into the cell. And that is an example of simple diffusion. Now, as that CO2 comes into our cell, we can see that there's a chemical reaction here with water. That results in bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ion. We can see that those hydrogen ions then are going to be uh, 
moved across this protein, this membrane protein, and we can see that ATP is being broken down into AT, ADP and phosphate. So here is an example of our primary active transport. So we are moving hydrogen ions up their concentration gradient into the lumen of the stomach through this membrane protein. Now if we follow those bicarbonate ions, we can see that they are building in concentration inside of the cell. We can follow the arrow and as they move across this protein and down, we can see that there's a lower concentration outside of the cell than there is inside of the cell. So now we are, uh, we are seeing a, a movement down their concentration gradient. But here we're looking at uh, the lower concentration of chloride ions moving in and in the opposite direction of bicarbonate into the cell where they are in higher concentration. So uh, that shouldn't happen, right? So this is a great example of our secondary active transport. Because we are having this chemical reaction in here, we're increasing our bicarbonate ions. They're moving through this anti-port secondary active transport system down their concentration gradient and that's allowing chloride ions to move up their concentration gradient. If we follow those chloride ions, we can see that they're also passing through a protein. And if you remember, passive transport channel mediated facilitated diffusion is mostly responsible for moving ions. So again, here, these are moving down their concentration gradient, but this is an example of our channel-mediated facilitated diffusion. Now those hydrogen ions and chloride ions can form hydrochloric acid, help you break down your broccoli, get the nutrients out that you need into the villi with the uh, vast amounts of surface area of the villi and the microvilli. And then the residual food is gonna help draw in water into your intestine and keep you having happy poops. You can think about that the next time you're on the toilet. I put this in. This is, this is a pretty cool diagram that I found that I just kind of happened to find and um, just updated the PowerPoint with this like literally two days ago. Um, I think if you leave this class with anything, whether or not you become a nurse or a doctor or a physical therapist, I think one of the most important messages that I hope you leave this class with is that you are going to be able to help your loved ones, your family and your friends uh, be advocates for themselves. And um, this, this just happened the other day. So I'm, uh, long story short, I'm helping my mother navigate insurance policies and we're being told by some doctors and some um, you know uh, businesses that well you have this one primary insurance and it's really great because it covers these uh, these drugs that you're taking that are thirteen hundred dollars uh, so it covers those it's a great insurance make sure you know we don't have to pay for that but the problem is that these uh, institutions are not in network with that. So looking at the other insurance, we're being told that we need to take Medicare so that we can go to the in-network institutions and then eventually have a lower uh, maximum out-of-pocket expense. So we're kind of back and forth the whole time. And, you know, uh, these, these bronchodilators are really important that mom takes those. So... I get this idea and I start reading about bronchodilators and the different chemicals that are out there. And I'm like, okay, so what are these things doing? And there's got to be more than just these two really expensive drugs. So I start looking at these other drugs and I'm trying to find out, well, how do these long lasting bronchodilators, uh, you know, what are some of the uh, other, uh, what are some of the other drugs that are available? And would those be accepted by this other uh, Medicare and this other insurance and can we talk to the doctor and actually change those medications or alter those medications so then we can drop this other insurance it's back and forth for like three days we're doing this but I came across this really cool diagram 
as far as how do these bronchodilators work. And so in this uh, red box, and we're going to be talking, this is talking about the smooth muscle uh, that exists, uh, sorry, uh, with our, um, within our, our lungs and around our bronchioles. And uh, this is just kind of an, a little image that's going to show us where these bronchodilators act. And in the red squares is all of these different channels that it acts on. And these are channels that we're studying right now and that we're gonna learn and that you're gonna understand. So some of you might be on bronchodilators for asthma. Some of you might have other family members that have these for COPD or emphysema. But I found it really cool because look over here, we're talking about calcium channels being affected. We're talking about our sodium potassium pump being affected. Over here, we have potassium channels. And over here, we have gap junctions that are communicating between the two cells and allowing potassium channels to migrate through. And then again, in that sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is just the a fancy term uh, for endoplasmic reticulum in muscle, uh, we're affecting calcium channels here. So, uh, you know, when you think about this, uh, we're not just doing all of this information so that you can go get your you know, medical degree and, um, you know, make money or, you know, help change the world. This also just has a normal application in everyday life. And so I hope that you uh, you know, leave this course with some of that, that knowledge and some of that skill level to be able to advocate for family members that maybe can't have these conversations with their doctors about what medications they should take or why it's beneficial to take one medication over another or help your family navigate insurance uh, like I did. So anyways, uh, I'll leave you with that. Okay, we've made it through our learning outcomes. We've described and differentiated between primary and secondary active transport, and we've gone over our examples. Now, after this slide, uh, there are a bunch of slides that have a bunch of questions and practice problems for you. Some of them we'll probably utilize in our in-class live streaming lecture. Uh, others, I would just recommend that you work on to help digest this material. That is it for our lectures for Unit 1. We have uh, our online quiz and our online test, so be sure you check the dates on your syllabus. Make sure you've put that into your calendar and make sure you find a good time to sit down that's quiet with a good internet connection. Remember, those quizzes and tests are open for a few days. Uh, you're only given one question at a time and you're not able to go back and you do have a time limit so you are expected to study you will not have enough time to look everything up so be sure that you get organized you practice you study and if there are questions that you're like ah, i just don't know maybe that's when you're referencing your notes or referencing a powerpoint slide so good luck on the test, and I will talk with you all very soon. Have a great day.